He always says smile, doesn't he? Morning everyone. We're going to be um, uh, having a look at uh, the, the least read books in our Bibles. Uh, the least read books in the Old Testament. Coincidentally, uh, over the next couple of weeks, we'll be also um, uh, looking at uh, these prophets. So, now the last three books of the New Testament, they're tiny little books. This sermon is longer than the book of Haggai. <laughs> okay? So, three minor prophets. The last prophets to speak for God to Israel. Haggai, Zechariah and Malachi. Now after that, God didn't say another thing for 400 years. For four centuries, they had to tell their children, someday God will speak to us again. One day. But he was silent for 400 years. And that's a long time not to hear from someone you love. But that's what happened. So here we are in the last part of the Old Testament. We look at Haggai and Zechariah particularly. And Malachi is the only one after that. And then God finished talking to Israel until John the Baptist appeared. 400 years later. I keep saying that just so you can get it in your head. This is a, a long time. Twice the, length, twice the time that Australia's existed. You know, it's just crazy. So no wonder everyone went to hear John. When you've waited 400 years to hear a prophecy from God and you finally hear that God's speaking again, it's no wonder the whole country went to listen. Now these are very short books because these prophets spoke for a very short time. Haggai only spoke for five days, spread over three months, and then he was finished. Zechariah was a bit longer. He was around for two years and they actually overlapped. Zechariah started just before Haggai finished. They said a little but a very important little. You might think back to the, the, the major prophets, Isaiah and Jeremiah. They preached for 40 or 50 years. And Haggai and Zechariah just spoke over a matter of months. They're what we call the post-exilic prophets. They came after the exile. They were part of the homecoming again. And that's the background to both Haggai and Zechariah. Before the exile, the prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah were full of warnings of disasters coming. If you don't lift, mend your game, if you don't lift, lift and do what you need to do with God, then you're going to be destroyed. The kings from the east will come and wipe you out and carry you off into captivity. And they didn't listen, did they? So what we're talking about is when the people came home, Haggai and Zechariah were among them and they spoke into that. The post-exiled prophets were full of encouragement and comfort trying to get the nation built up again. So first of all, they spoke at the same time. Both of them carefully dated their prophecies, which few of the earlier prophets had ever done. They actually date them to the day and the month and the year when they said things. So each prophecy of Haggai, and he gave five, each has a date, an exact date. So we can see just how many days or weeks there lay between each of them. And the same with Zechariah. And the year is 520 BC. They're back in the land, but it's a rather depressing picture. They both spoke in the same place. That's the slowly rebuilding city of Jerusalem in Judah. And they both spoke to exactly the same situation. I'm going to give you a little bit of history just to help you see what was happening. The Persian Cyrus conquered Babylon in 538 BC. And because he was a better dictator, a more benevolent one, a more humane man, he said that all those taken 
from their country can go back, provided you build a temple in which you can pray to your God for me. So that he was not entirely disinterested in this, but nevertheless, he made it possible for Jews, among others, to return to their homes. But only 50,000 of them ever went back. And the rest, having largely been born in exile, had established themselves. They weren't slaves in Babylon. They were allowed to trade. And Babylon was right on the main river there and was a trade route east to west, north to south. Babylon was right there in the heart of the, uh, of the empire. So it was a good place to trade and the Jewish people are very good at trading, aren't they, to this day. They know how to make money and they became quite wealthy and they had businesses that depended on that trade route. You know, they all knew that there's no trade route through Jerusalem. So I'm afraid many of them said we're staying in Babylon. Anyway, only 50,000 returned to the land and the rest stayed. Those who did return were led by two men. One was a prince, Zerubbabel, and it's clear from his name that he'd been born in exile. His name means the seed of Babylon. <coughs> so that's where he was born. He'd never seen the promised land, but he was the only surviving member of the royal line of David. So he had to go back. He was an important person. The man who accompanied him was a priest called Joshua, and Joshua re-established the priesthood. Joshua is the same name as Jesus. Yeshua. It means God saves. God our Saviour. And so Joshua went back to re-establish the priesthood in the temple. Those who came back were primarily motivated by spiritual interests. They certainly weren't motivated by any commercial attraction. They weren't going to be wealthy. It was going to be a hard struggle. They were going back to a land that hadn't been cultivated for 70 years. They were going back to a city in which there was not a wall standing. And they were going back into a place where the people who had survived there didn't want them. They were called Samaritans. They were half Jewish, and the few, the few Jews who managed to stay in the Promised Land had married non-Jews, and it became kind of a half-caste race, and they were regarded by both the Jews and the other locals as outcasts, because they didn't fit in with either community. And that was the beginning of the Jewish and Samaritan hatred of each other. The very first step in Jerusalem was to follow the example of their ancestor Abraham, gather a few of the stones and make an altar and thank God for getting them back. The next thing was to get the temple built. Because there were a few of them and they had no resources, they decided to build a very much smaller temple, just a little one. But at least it was a temple and they laid the foundations to this little square building around the altar. Now all this had involved great sacrifice. They'd left friends, relatives, nice homes for temporary accommodation and tents. They'd left prosperity for poverty. They'd left trading for agriculture. And now they must learn to dig again. And as time wore on, the dream faded. Fantasy gave way to reality. And the size of the task discouraged them. And their hearts sank. The opposition of the local people, the Samaritans, to their return was very strong and the financial subsidy that Cyrus had given them to go back it stopped. When Darius replaced Cyrus he got involved in wars and wars are expensive. So the first economy he made was to cut off the subsidies that had been given to the returning people to build their temples. So now I uh, Exiles, they find themselves without money. So they stopped building after only two years. And for, for, for 14 years they didn't put up another stone in the temple. Just the foundations were in and low walls. But that was all. And after two years they gave up. 
they had the money for the temple. Now, when I was in Israel, I went to a place called Tel Arad. It's um, it protects the uh, the southern boundary of the land of Israel from all the Midianites and the otherites <laughs> that come, come sweeping up through the Negev desert to attack the rich pasture land of Israel. And so it's it's on a low hill. It's a fortress city, and uh, and that's what it does. It was there from ancient times. Solomon. Uh, rebuilt it. So I'm going to show you a couple of pictures because in that city is the only example of a temple patterned on the temple in Jerusalem that these guys were building. And you can see exactly what it looked like because the state that it's in now is in exactly the same state that I just described you after that two years. I'm going to show you a picture. Okay, that's the temple. There's the court, the courtyard. That is the altar. This is the doorway to the holy place here. That's the holy place. And just in that tiny little space there, that's the holy of holies. Alright, so as you can see, that's pretty much what those guys had after two years of building. Right? And so this is a temple at Tel Arad. I didn't take that picture, but I took this one. That's the altar itself. You can see there the stones. They're all rough stones. To make an altar, you weren't allowed to use cut stone. It just had to be the way they found it. It's very big. It had to be quite big because they're putting whole balls on it and stuff like that. So that's the one thing you understand when you get over there is the size of some of these altars. And lastly, that's that most holy place. This is the Holy of Holies. Now this is a room, it's a cubicle. I'm trying to find a space in here where it would fit. It would fit between the wall and where I am to the back wall. That's about the size of it. About three metres by a metre and a half. It's tiny. right? Now the, the thing that shocked the Israeli archaeologists and the Christians and the Jews is what they found here. Because here is a standing stone idol. There was another one beside it here, which is in the, in the Israel Museum. So here you've got the most holy place of a Jewish temple, and in the most holy place there's two idols and two incense altars to make offerings to those idols. Okay? So... You can have a look at roughly the way this place looked in Jerusalem. It's an exact copy of the one in Jerusalem. And it dates back to the same time. Alright, so when I was going through it, I thought, what on earth use can I make of this place? It's just a pile of ruins. Here we go. All of a sudden I remembered, hang on, I've seen a temple that looks just like that. That's what it looks like. That's what it would have looked like to them. Half-built walls... An altar that's just not finished, but, you know, it's just there. A holy of holies. No roofs, no walls, no timber, no furnishings, nothing. That's what they would have had. So you can feel, you can imagine the depression that they were feeling. That's when Haggai spoke to them. He'd come back with them from exile and I think he was probably a priest. There was a very large proportion of the people that came back were priests. And unusually for Old Testament prophecies, his messages were not poetry. They were all prose. But the word of the Lord came not to Haggai as to the other prophets, but by Haggai. 
which means that it was a word of insight rather than revelation. He saw what was really wrong and why the dream had collapsed and why it was all so, so depressing. He could see it, but he brought word after word from the Lord 26 times in just 38 verses. Thus said the Lord. And he brought the word of the Lord to them in this second shortest book in the Old Testament. Because he dates each message, we know that he gave all his prophetic messages in just five days, and yet he brought 26 words from the Lord over those five days in a three-month period. And they're grouped around certain things. Haggai came asking questions. Chapters 1 to 3 are all about questions from the Lord. The Lord questions the people. He makes them think. Because the real problem is that their thinking has gone wrong. How many times have I said that in this pulpit? Their thinking has gone wrong. And when your feelings are depressed, it's usually because your thinking has gone wrong. You're thinking the wrong way. You need to re revise your thoughts. What does the scripture say? Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Okay? It's amazing though, you know, it's, God's people sometimes don't like to think, do they? Of course, we don't have that problem here. <laughs> you know, in fact, all, at, at times, preachers and prophets need to make people think and to provoke them to think again and ask questions. And that's how Haggai tackled the situation. He said, basically, your thinking's all wrong. So I'm just going to pick out bits and pieces of these questions that he asked on behalf of God. He was trying to get them to rethink. The word he used was consider your ways. Consider your ways, as our translation put it. Now, as I was telling Merrill, if you want to look up sermons on Haggai, most of them are from Baptists in the United States, and they all use this consider your ways passage to get people to give more money into the house of God. <coughs> now, I'm not doing that today. All right? So you can take a deep breath. We're not going to send the collection around again. See, they come up with this idea that in fact God had caused this disaster, this disappointment, and they were suffering from it. But actually it was the other way around. They had caused it. And God was simply responding to them. They had actually taken the first steps into this depression into this recession, into this time of inflation. He says, now your food's short, your money's short, you put your money in a bag with holes in it, it just seems to go. It's good picture language, isn't it? That's exactly how people feel. You know, you put your money in your pocket, it's not there. It's, you put it in a bag with holes in it. Your food fails, your crops fail, you come to conclusion that it's the wrong time to build the temple and that you can't afford the energy or the money. And he actually said all this happened because you stopped building the temple. It was the other way around. You shouldn't be saying we can't afford to build the temple in this time of inflation. What caused the inflation? It was you stopping building the temple. As soon as you stop putting God first and his house first, that's when things began to go wrong. But you didn't notice. So was the ham or the egg first? Which was the cause? Which was the effect? And they were thinking exactly the opposite way. So he said, now, give careful thought to your ways. Consider your ways. Think about what you did. And it was you who stopped building the temple first. And then he really began to attack them because he says, look at your houses, wood panelling. Now you must realise that when they went back, wood was very scarce. The Babylonians had chopped down all the trees and taken them away. And they had to import wood from places like Lebanon where there were cedar trees. And so a person with a sealed house, that was something. There was no sealed houses when they came back, right?
and a person with a panelled dining room means that they're spending a lot on their own houses. And he's saying, each of you is living in an ideal home. He said, look at your houses and what you've spent on them. And look at God's house. The wall's only up this high. This high. You're more concerned about your own house than his house. That's what caused the recession. That's why God isn't blessing your house. That's why inflation is running away with your money. It's because you're not putting God first. It's a very simple message. He says, just compare your own home with God's home. And that'll tell you where your priorities have been. It wasn't that there was no money to begin with. They just didn't want to use their money. They wanted to use the money from Cyrus to build the temple. And when that stopped, they stopped building. But they still had the money to build their own houses. First things first is the, what this message is all about. That message had a real effect. They really responded positively and they said, come on lads, let's build the temple. He really was a successful prophet. You know, all the prophets before the exile were failures and the prophets afterwards seemed to have been listened to. They'd learned their lesson and they got it going. And as they did Haggai's last word to them on that first day was this. Thus says the Lord, I'm with you again, off we go. And so they got stirred up, they took a little time, about three and a half weeks, to get the builders organised, get more material, and three and a half weeks later they're off and building. Just over three weeks later, less than a month, and morale is now declining again, largely because the old people have started talking. We don't gossip, do we? <laughs> we? We don't think back, do we? Oh, why play them old people? It's so very human. It's the old people are saying, they're looking at that, and they're saying, it's a poor little thing, isn't it? It's nothing like the temple of Solomon that we had when, that was there when we left. Look at that. It's pathetic. Now this kind of discouragement is devastating. It can just rip through a community. And Haggai had to speak again from the Lord to keep them building. And he said, don't despise the day of small things. Better begin small than not at all. Let's just get a temple up. God's not so worried about the size of his house. He just wants a house to live in where he can dwell among his people. So don't despise the day of small things. Now that's a lovely message, isn't it? I think we've used that here as we've been um, uh, doing the jobs I have to do uh, back a couple of years ago. Don't despise the day of small beginnings. He got them going and he made promises again. And he said, I'm with you. And he said, don't be afraid. Be bold. Be strong. For I am with you. I want to write a chorus about that. Be bold. Be strong. For the Lord my God is with you. That's straight out of Haggai's message. Then he talked about the future. He spoke to them about the future where God would shake the heavens and the earth and shake the nations. And he was in control of nature and history. And then a very strange and difficult verse to translate comes up. And the desire of all nations will come. The desire of all nations will come. Now I'm among the many who think that that's a promise of the Messiah. Right? That's, to me that's what that is. The desire of all nations. As I was researching this, I come up with an alternative. There are others who say that the word desired is usually translated in the Old Testament as valuables, as treasures which you desire. Maybe it's a promise then that further gold and silver will come 
to help restore the temple to its original condition. It's saying the treasures of the nations will come. So I'm going to shake the nations and they'll send their treasures here. And the amazing thing is that's exactly what happened. Shortly after that prophecy, a whole wave of silver and gold came from Babylon or from Persia, as it was now, to help with the rebuilding. So whatever it means, the money started flooding in. And then God says, I will fill this house with my glory, and the glory of this house will be greater than the glory of the former house. And in fact, ultimately it was. It wasn't this one. Herod, Herod, Herod the Great rebuilt the second temple and that's the one where we see just the footings of it in Jerusalem now, the temple mount where the Muslims have that gold dome of the rock and the, 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 the black dome of the mosque at the other end. Um, that's the temple that Herod built, that's the temple that Jesus knew. It wasn't finished in Jesus' time. I walked down paths alongside that that weren't there in Jesus' time. And so with all these promises, Haggai kept them going. And the next crisis came two months later. It's December and there's no rain. I was in Jerusalem in December. It rained. It rained and it rained and it rained. It was cold, it was miserable, it was windy. But here, it's a big deal because no rain, no food. They had to have the rain to grow the food. And they came to Haggai and said, just a minute, you said everything would go right when we started rebuilding. We've rebuilt so, so much and are we getting a roof on now? And God hasn't sent the rain. It's going to be another bad harvest. It's a bit of a problem for Haggai. He said, this must need careful thought three times, he said it. Why God hasn't responded immediately to your rebuilding, there must be a reason. And the reason was that among the people, there were those who did not have a pure heart motive. What he actually said was that if you put dirty dishes in with clean dishes will the clean dishes clean the dirty dishes or will the dirty dishes defile the clean ones and it goes one way doesn't it so he said that's the problem they were working on the temple but they were not right before God they took his message to heart they put things right and the rain began he was a good prophet he really got through to them. And the word from the Lord was, from this day I will bless you, because they got the message. The fourth day of his prophecy was a message for Zerubbabel and for him alone. And the message was, you are the signet ring of God. The signet ring is always worn by royalty. And what God was saying is, Zerubbabel, from you, the royal line will be established. The royal line will be re-established. He was the prince in David's line. But of course he could never be king because under the Persian king nobody else was allowed to be a king. They could be governor and so he was made governor of Judah under the king of Persia. But he couldn't be king. But the promise was made to Zerubbabel and there will come a day when I'll shake the nations and when I shake them I will establish, I'll overthrow their thrones and I'll establish the throne of Israel and your descendants will be in it. So he's made these promises. He will shake Persia, Egypt, Syria, Greece, even Rome, and he'll re-establish the kingdom of Israel from Zerubbabel's line. And on that day, he says, I'll take you, and I will make you my signet ring, for I've chosen you. This was never actually fulfilled in Zerubbabel's lifetime. But an extraordinary thing happens when you study the genealogy of Jesus. You know those long lists of names? They are very, very important. And there are two genealogies of Jesus in the New Testament. It's a bit of a worry for some people because they're different. The 
They seem to contradict each other. But one is the line of Joseph in Matthew and one is the line of Mary in Luke. The two family lines which both went back to David, separated after David, and they came back together in one man, Zerubbabel. Then they separated again. Isn't that interesting? So that in fact the name which appears in both Joseph's genealogy in Matthew 1 and Mary's genealogy in Luke 3 contains this special name. Ancestor of Jesus on both his father's and his mother's side. As David was ancestor on both his father and mother's side. So Zerubbabel has a very important place in history, doesn't it? In the history of salvation. God fulfilled his promise to that man by putting him on both sides of the genealogy of his son. So I think that's a lovely thought. The message of Haggai may be summed up very quickly. First things first. And particularly, God put God first. So thank you, Haggai. Thank you for reminding us of that. And praise God the people listened and they put it right. They put first things first. They got their hearts right with God and they got on with the rebuilding of the temple. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.